this is a rather more serious video than is the norm for me, although some of my videos do tackle serious topics. I admit to also having a penchant for satire and mickey take, it's part of my nature. However, I want to look at the role of the various churches in World War II and how they both failed and succeeded. Before I do so, I'm going to say part of the prayer for the dead from the Orthodox tradition as a mark of respect. O God of spirits and all flesh, who has trampled down death and overthrown the devil, and given life to thy world, do thou, the same Lord, give rest to the souls of thy departed servants, in a place of brightness, a place of refreshment, a place of repose. For thou art the resurrection, the life, and the repose of thy servants who have fallen asleep. O Christ our God, and unto thee we have ascribed glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thine all holy, good and life creating spirit, now and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. There's also another reason I use the Orthodox Prayer for the Dead, as I wanted to start with Archbishop Damascinus. There is a contention put about sometimes that the formalised nature of the Catholic and Orthodox churches render them more prone to persecuting the Jews or other minorities. I would say this is an incomplete narrative. There are certainly areas of Europe where it is true. The absolutely abominable regime in Croatia under Pavlik is does no favours for Catholics. Pavlik's usurpation of Catholicism and mutation of it into some sort of horrendous nationalistic theory that removed all humanity from both himself and those he persecuted are not something I would ever defend. But let's return to Archbishop Damascinus. Archbishop Damascinus Papandreou was born in Dovizia, Greece in 1890. He enlisted in the Greek army during the Balkan Wars, ordained a priest of the Greek Orthodox Church in 1917. He was appointed Archbishop of Athens in 1941. But it's his role during the Holocaust that he's remembered for nowadays. During the Holocaust, Archbishop Damascinus and Athens police chief Angelos Ivar saved thousands of Greek Jews. Although an estimated 87% of the nations of Jewish population perished during the Holocaust, 10,000 survived, largely due to the Greek people's refusal to cooperate with the German plans for deportations. Damascus is famous for his letter that he wrote to, in reply to the Germans. Some of this is quoted in this article I'm scrolling through, if I can find it. Here we go. The Greek Orthodox Church and the academic world of Greek people protest against the persecution. The Greek people were deeply grieved to learn that the German occupation authorities have already started to put into effect a program of gradual deportation of the Greek Jewish community, and that the first groups of deportees are already on their ways to Poland. According to the terms of the armistice, all Greek citizens, without distinction of race or religion, to be treated equally by the occupation authorities. The Greek Jews have proven themselves valuable contributors to the economic growth of the country and law-abiding citizens who fully understood their duties as Greeks. They have made sacrifices for the Greek country and were always on the front line of the struggle for the Greek nation to defend its inalienable historical rights. In our national consciousness, all the children of Mother Greece are an inseparable unity. The Miskinus is also famous for the reply he gave to the Germans when threatened with death, that he would prefer to be hung as it was part of their tradition. his tradition. He was referencing the Ottomans hanging a previous archbishop by making this uh, uh, rather dark joke. I'm not suggesting for a moment that every Greek Orthodox believer was as idealistic or as full of passion to save others as Demeskinus, but it does show the weakness of making absolute or sweeping judgments about these matters. There is a whole patchwork of churches doing good and bad things in the World War II narratives. Sometimes one church is doing both at the same times, or is doing good in one place and bad in another. It is difficult to arrive at any conclusion except that they all had some successes and they all also had some failures. The scale of the barbarity was such that I think this that was... Any other outcome would be unlikely. I'm going to turn to some other figures now. Perhaps the most controversial church is my own in World War II. I'm not blind to that fact. No, so intellectually dishonest as to pretend there are not issues there. 
However, these issues have sometimes themselves sadly become a uh, an opportunity to engage in bigotry and generalised slaps of Catholics. People doing this don't seem to realise the irony of, of doing that. The legacy of Pope Pius is, is disputed, to say the least. I've used Britannica for this because Britannica at least tries to make an attempt to see things from both sides. And the subject is so complicated, you cannot help but try to do so if you wish to have some honesty about it. I would say that it's judgment of his legacy, which I'll read out, seems reasonable. Legacy, the controversy that followed Pius throughout his life did not stop with his death. Throughout, though upon his death he was praised effusively by world leaders and especially by Jewish groups for his actions during World War II on behalf of the persecuted. Within a decade he was depicted in German playwright Rolf Hochschild's deputy as indifferent to the Nazi genocide. This play is controversial itself, as it's more than one critic has noted that it's essentially possibly Soviet propaganda as much as truth, and it's very hard to get to the bottom of it. More recently, John Cornwall's controversial book on Pius Hitler's Pope characterised him as anti-Semitic. Both depictions, however, lack credible substantiation. Furthermore, though Pius's wartime public condemnations and racism and genocide were cloaked in generalities, he did not turn a blind eye to the suffering, but chose to dip, use diplomacy. It is impossible to know if a more forthright condemnation of the Holocaust would have proved more effective in saving lives. They would probably have better assured his reputation. Not surprisingly, the move to beatify Pius XII alongside John XXIII in 2000 provoked a storm of controversy. Nor is it surprising, the hurt and pain of the Holocaust is very real for people whose families died in it, and there were very great failings made by the church. At the same time, it diff there were those among it who also sacrificed their lives and their reputation. There are very few churches that emerged from World War II with a perfect reputation, and the matter of religion is also mixed up with nationalism, national histories, and varying conditions in various places. Croatia's absolutely horrid regime is mixed up, of course, with its dislike of the Serbs and their constant battles with each other. Whereas in Italy, the anti-Semitic elements of German fascism didn't really seem to take hold or be something that the Italians were overly interested in. It was only when Italy fell and the Germans walked in that any attempt, any mass removal of Jews at all began. That's not to say, of course, that Italian fascism was particularly lovely. They had their own wonderful techniques and ways of dealing with people, which I certainly wouldn't want to have suffered. Then you have countries like the Netherlands, where which was a country that, while not absolutely a majority of Catholic believers, had a large number where yet again, it was when the Germans took over in, in force, the G Jews went out. Before that, they managed to live some sort of life, even if it wasn't much of a one. Denmark perhaps emerges the best of all, of all the countries with small population of Jews, as most of their Jews were smuggled out and rescued in, de in a daring number of smuggling operations, although there is a certain amount of propaganda about those, and some accounts note that the smugglers were quite happy to charge quite high sums off people being taken out. Reality is always messy and complicated, and full of shades of grey. I'm going to touch on a few more people from various churches as well. At the level of the individual clergyman, or, or prelate, I'm going to take a few examples of people from different Christian denominations and churches to show how complicated and messy the thing, the whole history of this is. First, I'm going to borrow one from Irish history, who's well known, Hugh O'Flaherty. Hugh O'Flaherty was well known for having created an escape light organisation for the Allied POWs and civilians. He's estimated to have saved over 6,000 and half thousand lives. After he was awarded a huge number of honours, including a commander of the British Empire, which must have been 
quite an interesting thing for a Kerry man to be given, especially as this was only a, a few decades after the Irish War of Independence. The Congressional Medal of Freedom, and was the first Irishman named notary of the Holy Office. He's also, of course, the subject of a very famous movie by, uh, with Gregory Peck playing in The Scarlet and the Black. As an interesting point of useless information, Gregory Peck is also related to a major figure in Irish history, Thomas Ashe, but that's a piece of trivia. Hugh Flatty is represents that at an individual level, people varied immensely in how they approached it. However, I'm not going to pretend all Catholics were Hugh Flatty. They most certainly weren't. Were not. And I'll give an, a counterpoint to it, this account and show a less pleasant person in the next section of this video. Less well known than the Croatian puppet regime during World War II is Slovakia's Joseph Tiso. However, it, the regime itself was in many ways just as bad. While it avoided the horrors of concentration camps like Jasnovac, Tiso, uh, uh, and I'm not going to mince words, betrayed his calling as a priest as far as I'm concerned by his collaboration with the Nazis and involvement in the mass deportation of Jews. His actions brought shame upon the church and shame upon himself personally. He is rec it's reckoned that nearly two thirds of Slovakia's Jewish population died due to his actions. And certainly I have no, no love for the man. I would find it hard to offer a prayer up for him. However, if people think um, clerical fascism is merely a, a Catholic prerogative, I'll turn to a list of clerical fascist organisations from World War II and afterwards in a moment. Yes, there seems to have been some sort of particular appeal to um, sort of hardline sort of Jansenist Catholics in these movements. Um, you had Belgium with um, de Grel and several other places with uh, similar movements, but you also had Protestant groups, which I'll get to in a second. I'm going to read out some of a, an excellent article, Clerical Fascism Context Overview and Conclusion by John Pollard. I will give links for all this stuff at the end, as I realise I'm building up quite a lot of material here. John Pollard comments on the fact that there's very little really in the way of an overview of clerical fascism. I've quoted some of the most commonly known examples of it. Pollard um, is reviewing a work here and notes, let's see, the term, let's see, and scroll again, having made a mistake there. Ugh. Too much information overload, perhaps, at this point. What is groundbreaking about this anthology is that this is the first attempt to identify and analyse a Europe-wide phenomenon. Thus, the term, term um, clerical fascism is used to encompass a wide-ranging collection of individuals, movements and regimes, or quite simply, moments in the encounter between the Christian religion and fascism, both in terms of the geographical spread, but also in terms of the Christian denominations involved. This means it is not merely Catholicism, which has been presented so obsessively in the works of writers such as John Cornwall and Daniel Goldhagen as the heart of this encounter, at least in the matter of the anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, but different forms of Protestantism, including Scandinavian variants and also the Eastern Orthodox churches. In addition, the political tendencies of members of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, who church was with communion at the papacy, but otherwise bore the characteristics like clerical marriage, vernacular liturgy of the Orthodox Church that were not are examined here. And that little passage, I think, sums up how we should regard, approach this matter. We need to be very careful of making any sweeping judgments about any churches involved. We run the risk of going down the same road as those we're opposing. I'm going to end with a very well-known poem by the Protestant pastor Frederick Gustav Emil Martin Nimolra. Yes, it's often used, but it's to, the message is still relevant. First they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came out for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. 
that sums up the problems with believing in the divisive rhetoric of fascism that seeks to create scapegoats and divisions in society and foster them. I have no love for fascism, no love for anti-Semitism. Be aware if you start commenting with uh, posts in favour of the Nazis or on this uh, thread, I will rebut you, or if you become a bit offensive, I will remove you.